get started, I do want to introduce myself. My name is Pablo Alvarez, as Eric mentioned, the director of admissions at Embry Riddle, Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. How many of you are were aware of Embry Riddle before this evening? Raise your hand. Well, a good amount of you. That's exciting. Well, for those of you who do not know, uh, my goal today is to share a little bit of information, not only about the university, but about the industry as well for you guys. Um, and answer some questions about how to apply for those of you who are interested and uh, give you a little additional information on that. My background is I actually studied aeronautical science. I'm a commercial multi-engine pilot, or I have my certificates at least. Uh, I graduated in 2008. It was one year after, um, was the year right after the Federal Aviation Administration increased the retirement age for pilots. So no pilot retired. Um, in the United States, there was a, a big battle between pilots and the government because the pilots were forced to retire at the age of 60, but the government wouldn't allow them to claim their retirement until 65. So you were not allowed to work, but you weren't allowed to claim retirement. So how do you, how do you live? How do you make money? Um, and uh, a lot of the debacle happened, and ultimately it was passed that they could extend their, uh, their ability to work. Great for them, it, unfortunately I wasn't able to get a job then. How many of you are interested in flying now? Raise that hand proudly. Let me tell you, you could have not picked a better time to be born because the industry is well, it is exciting, there's a huge exodus happening in the airline industry and a lot of positions are becoming available, so we'll talk about that as well. So if you go on to the next slide, I'll show you a little bit of information about, um, and we're going to just click on the next there. Okay, one more time, there we go. Go on into fast facts. So, uh, we have two residential campuses, one in Daytona Beach, Florida, and one out in Prescott, Arizona. Have any of you been to Daytona Beach, Florida before? Yeah. A lot of you have probably been to Orlando, or it's just been to Orlando. A good amount of you, very good. So we're just an hour away from Orlando. Um, if you come to the Florida campus, we don't get too far there. If you come to the Florida campus, um, we're close to the Cape, we're close to the parks as well, and um, there's quite a, a, a few things to do. We're also able to see the launches and uh, Class sizes are roughly five, uh, sorry, 32, 25 to 26 students to a class. The classes do cap at roughly 5,000 students. So we'll go on to the next one. So something that we want to highlight to you, you can go on to the next as well, highlighting the distinctions. So there's a couple things that I'm going to talk to you already here about the industry. Um, as far as entry riddle, we are very well known for aerospace engineering. We're actually ranked as the best university for AE in the United States. Um, and we have it for quite a few years. There's a lot of other degree programs also available, things like mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, civil, computer, software. All those disciplines are actually needed in aviation and aerospace. Um, civil engineering is a great example. Yes, we need, um, we will teach you and, and you can learn how to do things like designing ro uh, roadways, designing taxi, uh, sorry, buildings, but there's also a need for designing spaceports. How many of you knew that there is a space tourism company in the United States already? For those of you who don't know, you probably don't know because it costs $32 million to take you up and back. And I don't know about you, but I don't have that kind of money lying around to use it to go to space. But there is a space company right now taking people to the International Space Station for a week. You get to fly up there with the astronauts and come back. There's a company called Virgin Galactic. How many of you have heard of it before? I'm curious. A few of you. Virgin Galactic is trying to make space travel affordable. And I do affordable like that because it's still a quarter of a million dollars. Not still very expensive, but 250000 sure isn't uh, $32 million. Space tourism is expected to become a $1 trillion industry. The national, um, uh, NASA in the United States out of Houston has actually reported that they receive once a month floor plans to design hotels in space. The coolest one that I saw is actually on a rotating basis. It's a kind of like an upside down wedding cake. If you will, and it has a core that rotates. That rotation creates false gravity, so people can walk in the in this hotel and not be floating around all the time. And then the core, the bottom, is the only piece that doesn't rotate, so you can go down there and have zero weight floating around the same and weightless. It's I know some of you are going, this is crazy, but let me tell you, it's the future. So that's what we have. Oh, and it went to work. Commercial space operations. Again, you guys can find it on the screen. Commercial space operations is the name of that program. And it helps prepare students to design not only the laws and policies of space travel, but also prepare the future so that we have these spaceports and that they're secure. Believe it or not, some things that our commercial space operations uh, students are doing is 
uh, determining how many bags you can carry in a space. Um, should we allow smoking to space? And the answer is probably no. Uh, but all these things have to be put into law, and that's what our students are exploring in the new thing. We also have engineering physics and space physics. Um, we have a student at Emory Riddle that actually won a prize because she was able to contribute something to the industry that not even the students with PhDs were able to do. And it's, um, it was determining where magnetic hurricanes were going. Have any of you heard of a magnetic hurricane before? So they have a, a fancy here name. They're called Kelvin Humpholz particles. And our students uh, were able to actually identify where these particles existed and then calculate their trajectory. Now, some of you are probably asking, why did that happen? Why do we care about magnetic hurricanes? It is theorized that the reason that planet Mars does not have an atmosphere is because it ran into a magnetic hurricane. So the potential to destroy life on a planet is at the hands of these, uh, of these systems because they're so powerful they can disrupt the magnetic sphere around the planet and cause the rays from the sun to come in, affect the planet, it takes away the atmosphere. Our students were able to identify where they are and calculate their trajectory. That's actually something you can do. If you're in and thinking, you know what, I like math, I like science, I like research, but I don't know what I could do. We have, uh, we and many other schools, I don't want to make it just about your data, but there's an opportunity for you to explore these different options by doing research. And then the first and only College of Security Intelligence in the one way True or false, you can learn how to be a spy. Raise your hand if you think I'm making that up. I'm so happy you all believe that. Some of you, I think, didn't raise your hand up, but just did not stand out. So you're going, being a spy, seriously? So there is a program called Global Security and Intelligence Studies. Every riddle was the first to have it, but there are a lot of colleges that offer this program. Now, uh, why is it important? Somebody, uh, let's get some response and feedback. Why is security important? What's going on in our world? Terrorism. What, has anybody stayed pretty with um, people's bank accounts in the United States and what's happened with that? Hackers have gotten into bank accounts and stolen money, um, um, debit card codes and pins, and it's unfortunate. Uh, believe it or not, and this is very sad, but there are people in this world that all they do 24 hours a day is try to hack into computer systems. So, and I'll tell you this, in the United States, even with a huge uh, hack that happened at Target, for those of you who aren't familiar with Target, it's a huge uh, warehouse store that's similar to Walmart. Um, they hacked in and took away not only people's information, but they also took their pins. Blue Cross and Blue Shield, a health insurance company in the United States that provides health insurance to at least a quarter of the American population, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, um, went in and took their first name, their last name, their address, and their social security number, which is huge for us. That's very personal. Our social security number is how we get a job, it's how our retirement is kept, it's a very personal number, and that's how you can steal somebody's identity. That's honestly all you need. First name, last name, and address, and social security. And you can be whoever you want to be, unfortunately. So, knowing all that, I'm still using my phone. I'm still using the internet. I'm still going online to check my balance. So the question is how do we um, ignore the security issues, but the reality is how do we make it safer? And that's what we're training students to do through the Global Security and Intelligence Program. It actually has a hacking system. We actually have a terrorism course as well, where we teach students how to make terrorist plots. Not so you do that, because that's you going to get you in trouble. But by creating them, you'll understand how terrorists act and how they engage. We have war room labs where students, some students will be the good guys and some students will be the bad guys, and you can actually try to go head to head to see who is more successful. And this finally, we even have a course that specializes students on becoming a spy. And I know you're thinking that may be weird, but spies, every country has spies. It's how you keep security, it's how you keep safety, it's how you keep intelligence data. So we train students on the key factors and habits that a spy requires. We don't teach you all, because obviously every country has a private way to final, final train spies. Um, but it's actually a fun program, and at the very end, one student will actually be designated a spy and the rest of the class has to figure out who they are. And it's not in a classroom. You actually have to go into the city and find who this person is. You have no idea who it is. And your job is to go into the city of, of Phoenix or Daytona, look at people, follow your clues, follow the things that you've been taught, and then tell the professor this person is this one. Super exciting. I'm telling you, I've been at Emory Riddle for 11 years. I'm on my third degree, and I'm probably going to go for a fourth because there's a lot of time. So a college of security intelligence. How many of you are interested perhaps in computer engineering or software engineering? 
Raise your hands proudly too. There's a lot of opportunities with that. Uh, I was telling some of you today that uh, airlines are using technology from World War II. Believe it or not. Why? Because nobody has stepped up to design computers and softwares that are secure as well. One of the biggest fears, why do we rely on this technology from World War II? We rely on it because it's secure. Nobody can hack into it. The least we want is to put a computer that has either wireless ability, Bluetooth ability, or connection to the internet. That's not secure because if it has one of those three things, somebody can hack into it, take control of the airplane, and fly straight to the ocean. To the so security is a huge, huge issue. And there's a lot of opportunity to specialize in things like computer engineering, software engineering, and um, security. Before I ask this other question, I will say this. Um, actually, I think it's on the presentation, so we'll carry on. You can go to the next slide, the same thing that we can do. Um, you can go to the next one. Okay. Outcome. So this is probably my favorite part. Here, because here we talk about the opportunities that exist in the industry. I'm going to ask you, oh, there's a video going. It's okay. Nicole stops in the line. It's okay. I'm, I'll tell you what that video has. And again, you guys can access this all online. So I want you guys to hear some feedback from you guys. Give me a number on how many jobs do you think exist uh, around the world that focus on aviation or aerospace? Keep in mind, it's a very niche market. Just shout it out. 270,000. 270,000. I like that. How many do you think there's more jobs? 11 million. 2 million. 50. 50. I get 50 more. Whoever says 11 million, that's a perfect on the radio or something, or you are you guess it. There are over 11 million different jobs that focus on aviation, aerospace, and even security and intelligence. So if you hit the next slide and skip the video, and you can skip the video there. Go next. Your battery's low, you want to plug some power. Because of that, over 90% of our students have a job in the field that they study within one year after graduation. And this is very similar with anybody that pursues a career in aviation, aerospace, and security. Why? Because there's a huge demand right now for that, and because of your specialization. Believe it or not, a great company called K-Scale did a, a report and said, a student puts two students side by side. Both students study the exact same thing. The one student that specializes in aviation or aerospace, a couple things happen. Number one, they have a higher chance of being employed. And number two, they also are offered a higher starting salary by almost $20,000 more just because they specialize in aviation or aerospace. Again, it's that demand that's going on. So 90% students employed within one year. Let's take aviation and aerospace out. What percent of students do you think have a job in the United States within one year after graduation in the field that they study? 10. Holy moly. I need to move to another country. That's the case. Give me another number. Who else? 50. 50%. In the back row, you're all quiet. 65. 65. Who said 10? Believe it or not, 32%. Early 32%. So focusing on aviation and aerospace is going to give you a tremendous advantage in the world. You can go to the next slide. So here are the stats that I was mentioning. Um, this is an older presentation. It went up to 16,000 or 17,000. Um, but you can see here just uh, the benefits of focusing the aviation or aerospace industry as well. Um, you can go to the next one. So here's a list of top employers that seek uh, entry level students or students who focus in aviation and aerospace. You can see that we have um, a lot of airline companies, but we have some non-airline companies. Wells Fargo is a bank. Why do you think a bank would want somebody who specializes cargo? Security. Who's in security? Good job. Did your homework. Security. Absolutely. Um, just making sure that, that we are able to continue using our resources in a secure manner as well is always important. You can go on to the next one. And that's skip the video. You can go on to the next one. And again. 
So whether you come to Riddle or not, I want to talk to you about career service departments. When you are searching for schools, you want to make sure that your school offers some form of career service assistance. Um, a lot of reasons for that. Number one, finding a job can be overwhelming. Sometimes you guys don't even know what are out there. For example, if I were to tell you there are positions such as revenue managers, or statistical analysts, or um, target, uh, target recruitment strategists. You guys are just listening to that and thinking, I have no idea what that, that is. Um, those are actual positions that feed into degree programs like business, uh, civil engineering, computer engineering. Um, and we get you, we, do, we help you build that bridge between, you know, okay, this is the position I think I want, and this is the degree that I'm seeking. So we help you, and other schools should be able to help you with finding those careers particularly. You go on to the next one. So here's a word of advice also, whether you come to Amber Riddle or not. Do an internship. Tell the person next to you, do an internship. Internships are glorified interviews in essence. And um, I have worked in the industry long enough to know that when a company starts hiring, the first thing they do is they look at the pile and see who did an internship and who did not. Why is that important? Because internships, like I said, are glorified interviews. They've already interviewed you. If you did an internship with a the company, they know who you are. They know your work ethic. They know how well you perform. And I'm telling you, that is the number one way to get into a job as quickly as possible, is by doing an internship. Engineering internships are usually paid. They give you a salary while you're going to college and you earn college credits. Airline internships are not paid, but they let you get into the full motion simulators and for the time that you're doing the internship, you get free flight benefits. And so does mommy and daddy, by the way. And let me tell you, if you ever get a chance to fly for free, it is scary and it is addicting. I had the chance to do that last year. My friend gave me his flight benefits and it was weird. I literally one day decided I was going to go to Paris. I packed a bag, I went to the airport and hopped on a plane to Paris. I actually woke up the next day thinking, I have to be dreaming this cannot be real. I just keep in Paris and get paid a penny. Um, so, and I have, I've had, I don't know if that's happened to you, Xavier, and I'll introduce you Xavier here in a little bit, but I actually had a really good friend once that I called up, he was doing an internship, or finished an internship with American, and um, I, I said, hey, do you want to come and we're going to go out to eat, do you want to get some pizza? He's like, no, I'm, I'm already going out to dinner. I'm like, where are you going out to dinner? And he's like, I'm uh, in Seattle, I'm going to Alaska. He had flown from Florida to Seattle, I was going to go to Alaska, just because he could, just because it was free. I mean, you don't get paid, but let me tell you, he's a Go on to the next one. Industry outlook. So, one, are people employing? Are people hiring? What are the salaries like? We're going to go into that right now. So, if you hit the next slide and talk about Lockheed Martin and some of the things that Lockheed Martin um, is suggesting. So, Lockheed Martin is a company in the United States that seeks air traffic controllers, meteorologists, engineers, pilots. Uh, they have a, a wide variety of things that they're seeking. And there is a huge retirement expected to happen. Over 140,000 of their employees will be leaving soon, offering a lot of opportunities for students just like you to work in this particular field, designing things for them. Lockheed even manages our whole air traffic, um, our flight system in the United States. So um, case in point, let's say uh, you guys are going to fly from the Bahamas to Fort Lauderdale. Your pilot actually, or not the pilot, the dispatcher will contact Lockheed and file a flight plan as required by the United States. It's an incredible company with a lot of opportunities for uh, a wide variety of different degrees or careers. If you go on to the next slide, I think the next one talks about the pilot shortage, and I'll spend a little bit more time on this one. Um, that, there's a number up there, or not here. Um, I uh, changed it on the other one, but there is a need roughly for almost 540,000 airline pilots across the globe. 540,000. To put that number in perspective, let me give you another number. In the United States, there aren't even 300 some thousand flight instructors. So let's say every teacher in the United States were to leave to fill the need in the airline industry, we would still be short. And that's a terrible thing because then we won't have anybody to teach. So the need for airline pilots is at its highest demand. We know this is a fact also that the starting salaries are going up for pilots, and that's a good thing. It's supply and demand. If there's a big supply of something and a little demand, starting salaries are going to be low because we really don't need pilots. But when the table skew and there's little supply and a high demand, you're a commodity and you start getting paid more. Starting salaries for airline pilots is roughly doubled, so almost forty to fifty thousand dollars a year. And I know that may not sound extremely exciting, but when I graduated at Riddle, they were making twenty-two thousand dollars a year. 
So to hear that we're at 50,000 is incredibly exciting and it's expected to continue rising. Now, I'm going to offer you something else. Maybe you're in here going, Pablo, I don't know about airlines or, you know, I, I think I'm going to think about cargo. Or maybe you're stuck on the airline thing, let me offer you cargo. Cargo pilots are doing 10 times better. A pilot for FedEx or UPS can easily make six figures, over $100,000 within the first five years, and they can easily be making upwards of $250,000 a year within their 10, uh, first 10 to 15 years. Believe it or not, too, the technology on cargo planes is 10 times better than on the planes you and I fly. Scary, but the mail is doing extremely well. They have more money to spend on technology like that. The airlines do not. So we're flying on technology from World War II. That lovely box of candy and sweets you're sending grandma is flying away with incredible technology. Um, but they're paying very well. So if you're not committed or stuck to taking passengers, consider cargo because they can pay very, very, very well. And as I said, there's a high demand growing across the globe. The United States alone is expected to need almost 23,000 new pilots every single year. When you add the whole global need across the world, like I said, it's expected to be half a million. I cannot stress this enough. If you want to be an airline or corporate pilot, you pick the best time to be born and be graduating high school. So, my mom and dad later, thank you. You can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, and again. So these are the fastest growing and highest paying careers right now through 2020. Civil engineering, electrical engineering, software engineering, and computer engineering. Average starting salaries for these careers is $100,000 right out of college. So if you're interested in any of these areas, it can be extremely lucrative and uh, very useful later on. Um, I think it's pretty obvious why these programs are in such high demand, but um, what do you think is the number one job in demand right now? I want you guys to, or degree. What is the number one degree that people are seeking right now in the industry? Aeronautical. Aeronautical. You're going to scare me if you do the real one. No, it's not aeronautical. Software engineering. That was actually my guess, and I got it wrong, too. Civil engineering. Say that again. Electrical. I'm glad they're meeting Computer engineering. Nobody's smarter than me. It's impossible to type this code 
too quickly. I'm going to go ahead and just put it in here, and he noticed that there would be an error problem if something kept the code faster than eight seconds. But he, he wrote in his report, no, it's impossible that somebody can type the code that quick. Well, guess what? A bright and intelligent young lady who did her job well, came up to the machine, did the code in less than six seconds. The machine could process it and zap the person with 100% x-rays for five minutes. Cook the person down. To boot, she got a message saying, sorry, nothing happened, try again. So guess what she did? Bah, hit it again. That was my Latino miss. Bah. Um, and started, unfortunately, to get a bad odor when she went. She saw she had literally put the patient. Um, industrial psychology, understanding human behavior to make technology safer and to make technology usable as well. How many of you have used something before or went online and thought, wow, this is not intuitive at all. This is not, we say, user-friendly. It's because a human factor psychologist did not look at it. So it makes a lot of money as well. So they, it's, I know, how many, nobody wakes up and goes, mommy, daddy, I think I want to be an industrial psychologist when I grow up. <laughs> we don't say that, but it's a lucrative career that can pay very well. Signs, how many of you have seen signs that don't have words but still understand what they say? That's industrial psychology and they're everywhere. It means I took that class. And I was told to make a sign saying customs and border patrol this way. I was like, oh my gosh, the easiest day I will ever get. So I got a piece of paper. I drew a little stick figure. I drew a book. I drew an arrow. I put an airport in the background to make it, you know, airport. And a sign. And I thought everybody would get it. So the teacher puts it up on the board and she starts asking, what is Pablo trying to tell us? One kid in the back row raised his hand. Um, the library is that way. I'm like, no. <laughs> customs and border patrol, clearly. Another student uh, read, um, collect your receipt somewhere. I'm like, why do you need to collect a receipt sign? What are you thinking? It was, though, the first moment that I realized that I interpret my environment different than other people. And I perceive the things around me differently than other people. Industrial psychology. And I'm harping on that one, but let me tell you, it is a very lucrative career. If you like psychology and you like engineering, it's an exciting career. It's designing things that people can use. And I will get off on that. Uh, subject now. So go on to the next slide. Here's the global security. I think we spoke pretty well about it. Um, I will say there's the one thing I'll add is uh, you can find this program at many places. At every riddle, we offer a Mandarin Chinese track and we also offer an um, Arabic track. You will attain such fluency in Mandarin Chinese and Arabic that your final two years at every riddle core classes will be taught to you in Mandarin Chinese and Arabic. Um, it's an exciting one to, to consider as well. We go on to the next one. Um, yeah, we'll kind of skip the video there very quickly. These are just some projects that students are doing. Um, you can kind of skip through this as well. So you can hit next. You can hit next about maybe. So you can kind of go through this. Um, while he's skipping through this, you can go once more and once more. And so through this, so that I've said all of this. Keep on going, keep on going. Again, you guys can keep on going. You guys get all this information from the web. We don't know if you want, I just don't want to. Once more, once more. All right, and then I'll kind of uh, read it. Uh, oh, skip through this until you get to um, next steps, please, and then I'll talk about that a little bit. So I'm going to mention um, some degrees to you, and I want you to raise your hand if you think I am making it up, or leave your hand out if you think I'm telling the truth. A degree exists in something called wildlife science, or a, all these degrees have to do with aviation. Wildlife science, get a bachelor's of science in wildlife science, we think that's a real thing. Real thing, some of you? Okay. Um, how about commercial meteorology? Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. I can't remember. Let's go to those two. Wildlife science. What do you mean wildlife science in education? Right? That's Yeah, why would you need wildlife science? Birds flying. You guys have no idea how many animals cause problems with the aviation industry. In Miami, once a week, you have a pool of crocodiles and another one day. Believe it or not, once the week there's a crocodile out there that falls with that line. You may think the airplane is powerful, but it's crocodile is pretty dark and heavy, and it will be damaged. So, 
So many of you are of uh, low on the Hudson accent. You guys always come back crash to say they came from the east. Understanding animals. And if you have ever thought, you know, I can be a veterinarian. I like animals. There's a place in the niche for you as well. Wildlife science is a huge thing in demand right now for many reasons. Number one, we don't want to be inhumane. We don't want to go, oh, there's a lot of birds here, so let's just kill them all. Yeah, we have to save planes. You know, you don't want to do that either. So wildlife science teaches you the animal environment. It teaches you about predatorial areas, about predators. It teaches you how to understand animal behavior to make the industry safer. And not only do airlines or airports hire them, NASA has a realm of uh, experts in wildlife science to make sure that the industry is safer. If next time we fly to Fort Lauderdale, if you are ever flying, coming in over water and landing, pay attention to the right. You'll notice a stick with a fake bird flopping around on the stick. It's a scarecrow. It's a bird that we've identified uh, thieves off of, the birds that are in that area. So by scaring the birds, we're not shooting them, we're not killing them, we're hopefully scaring them away and allowing you to have a safe flight in. This is huge. I've given you two examples of many more. You would not believe um, some of the other major issues that can happen with um, aviation. Commercial meteorologists. How many of you, has anybody thought about doing meteorology? Weather? Let me tell you something. I love, I would totally be a TV meteorologist. Number one, they make me super tall. So I could be like, you don't want down here. So I like that. But um, they also have commercial meteorology. Commercial meteorologists make upwards of $100,000 driving salary as well. What is it, how many of you think you know what a commercial meteorologist does? Say that again? Oh, no, dude, you're, I, you know what, you gotta, you're doing good. You gotta start for me because you're, you're throwing out answers. Why would it, what is a commercial meteorologist? Some people are these pilots with the weather. I can definitely see that. It's actually, it's one that's uh, also addressing. It's called aviation meteorology, where you do provide a specific forecast of the weather. Thank you. That was a good, uh, good. How many of you know? How many of you know what Walmart is? Or Walmart Target. Do you know Walmart has commercial meteorologists on staff? About forty of them. You know supermarkets hire commercial meteorologists. Why would they care? So he says sometimes when we have to shop or have or something related to the cars, and it's actually very close. Um, city, cases in points, in Florida, if I've been to Miami before, if you walk into the grocery store or Walmart in Miami, you will not find a snowblower. Why? Because the chances of snow in Miami are very cheap. It's not even bad. I have to go through the cry at all. Um, you would think they don't tell that's extremely obvious, but how obvious is this? Where do you draw the line? Where do you say you stop sending snowboards here? Is it all through Florida? Is it all through Georgia? Do you draw it somewhere in the middle of the country? Where do you draw that line? Because sending snowboards to a city that's not going to need them costs money, and it costs money to bring them back. Groceries as well. Bringing in shipments to a certain area where we're saying we're going to offer these many apple fruits, and then find out there was a terrible winter storm in the area. How these crop shortages cause the grocery store for the grocery to incur an incredible debt. Commercial meteorologists do are experts at long-term forecasting, which is extremely difficult to do. Provide companies with data and forecasts on what they should do with their products. It's a mixture of a balance between business and meteorology that can open incredible doors to later on. And I guess that there's so hard to find that people who study meteorology will study things like a weather forecasting or research to study tornadoes, hurricanes, and that's exciting. But there is a need for people who understand business and like weather as well. So there's so many more options. I'm running through my head with them. Um, I will stay as long as I need to to uh, answer any questions or concerns you have about careers. But I hope that I've been able to open your eyes to realize that there's so much more in the world for aviation, aerospace, and security and intelligence. A good amount of you actually told me at the beginning of this presentation that you're here to learn also about every riddle. So if I may have two quick minutes, I want to show you guys just a little bit about the application process at our university. So you can go ahead and click next now. And we'll wrap it up here. And I'm trying to be sensitive to your time because I realize we started a little late today. But at every riddle, we do require an application. And I'll tell you what, 
for having to listen to me for so long, and I probably speak very fast, because I do speak English, but I can speak it at a Spanish-speaking pace. So if anything, let me give you a four-letter code. It's D as in Delta, B as in Victor, S as in Sierra, and T as in Tango. If you type those four letters at the end of your application, it will bring the $50 that you owe down to zero. So you do not have to pay for a buy. And you give us an opportunity. Give us an opportunity to continue your business and give us an opportunity to make you an offer. So that application fee, those codes do not work, so do not write it down. The one that I gave you will. Um, we'll also need official transcripts from your high school. We'll also need one of two things. A financial affidavit of support. It's a document that comes as an application and it tells us um, how you plan to pay for your studies at every riddle. And um, it's not something that has to be followed to a TSSA guide or a bank statement is the other option that you can submit. We're test optional at every riddle, which means we do not require the test score at all. If you decide to submit it, we look for around an 1100 SAT math plus verbal or we look for roughly a 3.5 GPA as well. I'm um, oh, sorry, the 25 on the ACT composite score. Again, though, it's not something that is required. And then uh, lastly, we do ask that an essay or resume be submitted. So um, I don't know what the next slides offer, but I do want to spend a little bit of time. These are our costs as well. Uh, roughly, it's up to 46,000 now, uh, roughly. But having shown you this, I think the next slide is the one that I want to talk about primarily. And it's funding your education or scholarships. And now it's not going to be the next one. One more. So regardless of where the presentation is, um, I do want you all to know, and for those of you who listen to me on the radio station, I've said this a few times, because I did not come from the wealthiest background, I did not come from the wealthiest parents. My mom is a, a Spaniard from a town north of Portugal, and my dad is from Cuba. Um, both of them lived very humbly um, and tried to be entrepreneurs. They started their own business. One business, unfortunately, didn't go well, but you know what, you live and you learn, so they tried the second. And um, it was some hard times. We didn't have a lot of money necessarily to spend. But I remember my mom always telling me that our present situation never determines what our future situation will be. And I think it's human nature to look at our present and think, well, this is what I have, this is all I get. But let me tell you, I've lived already long enough to realize that all it takes is sometimes one second in your day to change how things happen. One connection, one person that you meet, one opportunity, an offer that can change the rest of your life. And we need to live with that optimistic mindset. The first thing you should know about scholarships is universities automatically consider you for awards. In most cases, you will need to have the SAT score for that. So if you are looking for a scholarship, let me submit that to those test scores because they can help you out. That is simply your starting point, though. There are other opportunities. One of those external scholarships and awards. Um, Darnell Butler uh, went to uh, University of Florida he did not pay a single penny. He found over $30,000 in scholarship money. If any of you are on Facebook, search him, Darnell Butler at, e, at Every Riddle. He actually posted all the scholarships that he received online for any of you to access. He's, he's that committed to helping students find scholarships. So some of you are asking, well, Papa, why is it so hard then? Why can't I just go online and do some pressing to find it? Well, obviously it's hard because everybody's trying to do that. But if you're willing to step out of your comfort zone, you may be surprised to see what you can find. Uh, if you heard this on the radio, I apologize for repeating myself, but Darnell found a scholarship, a $5,000 one, and all he had to do was plant one tree at a high school. One tree. That's all he had to do. So you're probably thinking, well, I don't, I don't mind planting a tree. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, Darnell went to Home Depot, which is an uh, establishment that sells trees in a lot of home items, and asked them if um, they would donate the tree. You should, if any of you know Darnell, you would know that he's not gonna, he was not going to pay a penny. He went to get a scholarship to go to school. So he went to Home Depot and he said, hey, I need a tree. I need you to go get a tree. And the manager looked at him and said, are you crazy? And Darnell was like, well, what would it take? He's like, I'll tell you what. If you get one news channel to come out and record this whole event, I'll give you the, I'll give you the tree. Darnell got two news anchors to come out and do the, the report. Now, let me tell you, is it uncomfortable to pick up the phone, call up a news channel, and say, hey, my name is Pablo, and I'm a student, and I'm looking. That's not out of my comfort zone as an adult. I'm not gonna, but I'll be honest with you. But let me tell you something. Um, the world is for those who seize it, not for those who wait for it to fall on their laps. 
if you have some persistence, if you get up and you say, you know what, I'm going to, what's the worst that's going to happen? I have a, I have a joking, or not a joking, though. And I always tell my sisters, for example, because people say, what's the worst that can happen that you don't get it? I always say, what's the worst that can happen that you do get it? Change that mindset. You never know what can happen. Darnell did it, got the few news channels out there, planted his tree, got his hands dirty, took a picture with the principal, sent it in. One week later, checked for $5,000 through the mail. His dad was so baffled that his dad called him up and said, no, this is fraud, we're going to jail, something's wrong, this is not right. Nobody just gives money on that quickly. We tell you, Darnell, and Darnell's dad called the company up and told them and said, you know what, your son was the first person to apply in over five years that we had this scholarship. Nobody ever applied. So for us, it was an easy win. The moment we got it, we said, that all you did a great job. And that's one of so many stories. Another one that he tells, Snickers, go online. Snickers gives um, it's either 500 or a $1,000 scholarship. And all you have to do is submit the UPC, the barcode, 200 of those, send those into Snickers. And they will go ahead and send you a scholarship as well. And Darnell, again, if you know Darnell, he didn't just buy them and eat them, he bought them and sold them. He <laughs> made a little kiosk online for scholarships, so money. He was collecting money back. And uh, he, he jokes and he says he would stand by the vending machine. I would sell them for a dollar. He was like, hey, do you have a Snickers bar for 75 cents right here? He said, a quarter. And to give you discounts. And he got that scholarship as well. And all that that I'm telling you, you can go online and find those applications. Again, is that uncomfortable? While your friends are out playing basketball, you're standing next to a vending machine selling Snickers bar? Yeah, it's a little out of your comfort zone. But let me tell you something. I, I did have to take out a small amount of loans, and I'm paying those back in. I don't regret it, but knowing what I know now, I just wish I would have had a bit more boldness when I was in high school, a bit more bravery, losing the fear, and sought those opportunities out. Because that money that I'm using to pay back my student loans, I could be paying something else, trips to the Bahamas and having fun. So you never ever know, and, um, and I know I'm speaking a lot on that subject, I just, in my 11 years in a room, I can't tell you how many heartbreaking conversations I've had with students that say, Pablo, I can't make it, I can't afford it. I can't make it, I can't afford it. It breaks my heart. It's those moments that I wish I had millions of dollars to be able to, to reach out to students and share and, and help them. But um, of course, my budget is limited as well. So if anything, go online, look for our love on Facebook, seek those opportunities out. The last thing I'll say on it, and Eric, I have to say, this is something that makes me think of you a lot. If, if you guys, if, there's anything you can, there's a lot of things you can glean from Erica, but if there's one thing you can glean from her, it's positive persistence and good persistence. Um, you're going to get told no sometimes in your life, but just because you get told no does not mean that's the end of the road. Persist a little bit, push a little bit, seek a little bit, politely and kindly. So Darnell um, was once offered, he went to go see a scholarship, um, another scholarship for doing something else, I can't remember right now, but it was supposed to be the amount of $3,000. And Darnell decided to actually go to the place and see if he could speak to somebody. And he went there and he told me, yeah, my name is Darnell Butler. I'd love to see the CEO or manager. What do you think that secretary said? Well, he's awful busy right now. You know, you're too young. So what did Darnell think? He persisted a little bit. He's like, well, man, can I leave a message? And Darnell also says, he's like, when you tell him that you're going to leave a message, you're not going to say, my name is Darnell or my name is Pablo. Here's my phone number. No. You're going to make it so long that she's not going to write it all down. She's not want, going to want to write it all down. And she's going to have to do something else. So he started, my name is Darnell Butler. I'm from um, the Bay Beach, Beach, Florida. I would love to have the opportunity to go to college, but my mom told me that if I go to college, I have to get on my own. And I don't want to go that much longer. Oh, God, I need to get out of college. I'm going to go study. And went on and on and on. And finally, the lady's like, you know what? Let me see if I can get him. And she called. Oh, because he says also, he's like, if I can talk today, I'll be back tomorrow. If he's not available tomorrow, I'll be back on Wednesday. If he's not available Wednesday, I'll be back on Thursday. If he's not available Thursday, I'll be back on Friday. I'll be back every single day that I can. I'll let me come and see him. So he said that she called people up and she's like, sir, there's somebody that wants to meet you here. Yeah, no, he says he's going to come back and meet you if you don't see him now. So, um, and sure enough, the manager comes down, and Arnold does the whole spiel again and greets the, the, the manager, the director. Do you know what that guy did? He took Arnold up to the top floor to see his boss, the CEO of his company. And Arnold went wide up there and did the whole same thing again, the whole spiel again. And right there, the sir wrote a check and said, you know what, boy, just here, have this. Arnold looks at the check. And you will not make it. You only knew Darnell. Darnell, and this piece, by the way, is online too on YouTube if you want to hear Darnell talking. I can send all of this stuff to you. Darnell gives the check back and says, Sir, that's very kind of you, but the scholarship is for 3000 That check is for 1000 oh, no. oh, Darnell said, that. I'm like, boy, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what that manager said? He's like, he's the CEO, said, Son, did you see the check? 
and then it looks at it again, trying to figure, like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure it's missing, you know, that three and the one. It was actually his personal check, a check written by the CEO. He said, you're gonna get the $3,000, but in all of my years doing this, nobody has ever come up or asked to see me to say thank you. So as long as you keep a good GPA, you're gonna get our scholarship, and me and my wife will write you a check for $1,000 every year. Let me tell you something. Is that uncomfortable? Is that uneasy? I'm, you know, that was telling me this, and I'm sitting in the chair, I'm like, God, you did that. That's got out of his mind. But let me tell you, there's something to be said about positive good persistence. The world belongs to those who seize it, not to those who get to follow down on I don't want to close without having an actual student speak with you guys. And I'm trying to leave you in. I'm sorry, Xavier, but I do need Xavier to tell you guys a little bit about what he's doing in every riddle. He's on a temporary hiatus until we help Xavier find a little additional um, funding. Um, he had some personal circumstances that brought him back. But I do want him to tell you a little bit about his experience in every riddle. Yeah, go for it. We roll, can we have you move your car so this gentleman can read, please? Thank you. Oh, what is that? And then Eric and I have a little surprise to do after we're something we go too far. So um, please welcome Xavier up to the stage. You're going to have a applause. He's not too shy. And then tell us a little bit about what you're studying. Tell us what you did. And as you can see, he's wearing a very cool admissions polo. Um, even as an international student, you're allowed to work on our campus. Um, it's a great way to build extra money, and Xavier helped us with not only our phone rooms, if you ever called every riddle, you might have heard his lovely voice on the phone. And um, if, or if you came to visit campus, he was one of the people that gave the tour as well. So Xavier, tell us a little bit about your experience. Okay, good night. Um, my name is Xavier Knowles. Um, I went off to every riddle in 2014, August 2014, as soon as I graduated from government high. It's, it, it was an amazing experience for me, especially because um, the admissions or um, counselors at every middle are awesome. My parents can tell you that they have never even visited my school. One. Two, they have never even spoken to my admissions counselor. I did everything between me and her. Her name is Tara. Oh. Yeah, she was the best. Anything I needed, she emailed me, Xavier, I'm looking for this. Can you get this? I would get these documents that send straight off to her. And by the time as I looked, by February 2014, I was accepted into every middle. By March or April, I had my student visa. It was, it was that simple. My, my experience with every middle was, like I said, an amazing experience. Um, I studied aviation management. It includes airport management and airline management. And if even if you love business, I've always heard that you should, if you, if, if you love business, you should find a specialty in business. So I love aviation and I love business so much that I found the degree of my life. I, I, find, I found the degree of my life up to, up, of a lifetime and I just went after it. So my degree is a, my goal is to get my degree in aviation management. Um, my minor is air, um, aviation. I want to fly, but I changed it to do um, flight safety. And the reason why I changed it to flight safety was during the time that I was off the school, the, the flight, the crash in the Bahamas with Dr. Miles Monroe, it really shook me. And I said, you know what, Xavier? Flight safety is something you should do. And I decided to switch my mind to flight safety. Um, if you want to know how much Bahamians I had in every middle, I didn't even know. I thought I was the only Bahamian that went there in every middle. But as a few weeks went on, I found out that it was like about five other Bahamians. If you think about it, it's a lot. Compared to every middle, it's a very nice sized school. And to find five Bahamians around you, like, they're from your island, and you can actually talk to them, and they have your accent. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, but now, right now, I think the number's up a bit, so it's about six or seven, and most of them are in engineering. Uh, yeah, engineering and simply aviation. Uh, I was a part of an organization called the Caribbean Students Association. I don't know if anyone have ever heard about it, but I joined this organization, they have an uh, organization at Embry Middle and Bethlehem for Quinnity and Mono. And 
I joined it because I wanted to find a connection with, um, with my people that I can relate with. And I said, I don't know, I, I, didn't, I didn't be scared to find a join other organizations because I was like, I need to find my comfort zone first. And when I saw the Caribbean Citizens Association, I was like, my Caribbean people, they cook, I can eat, I can, yeah, I can get off the American food some bit. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it really allowed me to get comfortable. And with this organization, I met some people that were able to help me. So in terms of like if transport, you have a friend who has a car, yeah. It, it, it all worked out. And because of me joining the Caribbean Students Association, I got a position as director of District 3. So my first year, not only I worked on campus, but I was director of five schools in the state of Florida, in my district. I was director of Embry Riddle, uh, Bethune Cookman, Stetson University, University of Central Florida, and FIT. And like Pablo was talking about, about those, um, just jumped on the plane sometimes to fly. We had a meeting in Melbourne one, one time for Florida Caribbean Student, Student Association. And as director, I'm supposed to visit all the different schools. We jumped to one of the uh, every middle planes with one of the student pilots because he had to do a night flight for his, uh, for his program. And we needed to get to Melbourne. We didn't feel like driving. So we jumped in two planes. Over to Melbourne for a meeting. After a meeting, we flew back to Daytona. Every middle is the best school if you want to get an experience of a lifetime. Another thing, I also was a part of an airport management club. There, there are some clubs at Every Middle you would never expect to find. That this is basically the campus life. You would never expect to find some of these clubs. And I joined the airport management club because I said, well studying this, this should be interesting. With this club, I was able to visit different airports all over the state of Florida. And with, I got a, a on-hand experience that was so amazing. We went to Fort Lauderdale Airport, FLL, and we went through the baggage, the, the parts that everyone don't see, we were able to see. So we went and we saw the baggage from Bay of Belt, and where it goes, then they took us over onto the one where we were literally standing on the new constructed um, taxiway, actually. And we were taking pictures and planes were like flying overhead and passing us. It, it was an amazing experience. Another thing, uh, Ambry Middle's campus, uh, it has, the, the residence life is amazing also because I've experienced my friends, and what's not. The Bahamians, they really, they really enjoy residence life because of the type of halls that we have. They have a hall, it's called, uh, is it, no, it's in Doolittle, the one that's like an apartment. Doolittle, Doolittle. oh, yeah, Doolittle. Doolittle, it has a, it's, it's like a shared, you share a kitchen space, and the room, it's two beds to a room, and you share a bathroom. And it's like, it's literally like an apartment. I, feel, I thought that was amazing. Because you have your desk, you have cable, you have everything you need, and what's the best place to be than in Florida where the, water, where the, where the, walk, um, the weather is quite warm, relatively sometimes. And the, the last thing I want to say is that people, you may look at the price of every little and be like, oh, it's a little shaky, but it's a great investment. Me, coming from a government school, I basically planned my my uh, my acceptance into Riddle to the T. I found a scholarship from the government of the Bahamas that's in airport management. They gave me a scholarship of seven thousand five hundred. Like he said, SATs are not mandatory to be submitted to every Riddle, but it's quite optional. I took my SAT and I submitted my SAT and I got a scholarship from that just for submitting my SAT. I didn't have to. I guess I asked my admissions counselor, I said, well, should I submit this? She said, yeah. And she submitted it, and all of a sudden I got an email about a scholarship came back. I went up um, with the government scholarship and a um, middle scholarship. I just had to pay everything else out of pocket, which is, it was fine with me, because I 
cut my uh, my thing down a lot. Um, the last thing to say is that oh yeah, working on campus. Like he said, I worked in admissions as an admissions um, tour guide. I worked in the call center, so I had. I had on hand experience helping students just like you, but from different countries all over the world. So basically every day, I had someone maybe calling from India, someone calling from Africa. I can't understand everything they're saying, <laughs> but I, I had to do, I felt it, it, was, it was a great experience being able to help people <laughs> who were in my situation and trying to introduce to them a school that they can, that they weren't able to see. Another opportunity also is Emory Middle has open houses twice a year, fall and spring. I took advantage of the open house while I was in the 12th grade. I just told my father, I said, I, I want to go to open house. And I just paid my ticket, and I jumped on the plane with myself, and I flew to um, Orlando, drive down to Daytona, and I was at open house. At that open house, it, it allowed me to it allowed me to really experience what Amphibital was. Like someone can come to you and they can tell you about what this school is, but if you just visit the open house and you actually see the residence halls, you take the tour of the campus, you're able to feel, you're able to see the food options instead of seeing it on the list. You can smell the food and see if you like it. But yeah, it, it, it really allows you to grasp what you want much better. So the open house was it, it, it really sealed the deal with me, and it was it was like a two day, two day open house, and it was full of uh, events, free food, and <laughs> I, 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 feel, I think that's the best thing. But if anyone you if you go to Orlando, just take the hour, I will drive down to Daytona, just um, visit the campus and say you want a tour. They'll give you a free tour. It'll show you everything you need to know and even more. So that's that's basically it. Yeah, that's basically it. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate that. So one way or another way that you can get scholarships is by being part of Junior Achievement. Um, Erica has done a fantastic job of reaching out to us and showing us the value in this. And Amber Riddle, along with a list of schools, has decided this year to offer scholarships to students just for being a part of junior achievements. And in this room today, we have two lucky winners that are receiving a scholarship today. And I would love Erica to have the honor to share this. Okay. I know many of you probably heard me on the radio. You know, I'm a water bag. But I just, you know, want to say this when I had the opportunity to fly to several of the uh, family islands and I see the opportunities that those bright kids have missed just because they're not here on the island. And I'm making a solemn oath to all of you today and to God that every year I will make sure that at least 10 of those students from all over the other family islands have a scholarship through J.A. Okay? If they are wrong, they enjoy the same opportunities that the kids in NASA have. And it's so funny that the two that will be receiving scholarships today are from Family Island. I guess you could call it Family Island. So can I have Bashan Russell?
okay? But that doesn't mean that if there's a need base that they can't get any more money as well. So, and if they want to work on campus, they're able to do that. So don't believe that fallacy that, oh, when you go to the United States, you can't work. Yes, you can on campus and it's tax free, okay? So you get all your money, okay? So you guys like to say anything? Because <laughs> he came to me when I went to Freeport. I'm going to Emily Riddle. I said, You are. I went to the campus and that's it. I'm just going there. So I know when we go to Emily Riddle on our college tour, I'm going to fly a plane in Emily Riddle because um, Florida Institute of Technology has you fly a plane. So you have to bear it now. Okay, you have, to have something to say? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so you guys can go back to school and drag it out. Definitely add Pablo. Um, he would be able to give you some information. And some of you, we would definitely like to interview you. And if you have a sign, we have a piece of paper that's passing. So if Emory Riddle will have any information, I mean, you, they're going to be sending information to you guys who signed your, your name on there. And just know that if, even if you're not a part of achievement, junior achievement, you can definitely reach out to me. You can reach out to other um, counselors, like McKenzie. Um, I forgot the other lady's name. College should not be something that you cannot attain. Everybody can go to school. They have schools that will give you scholarships if you have a 2.0, okay? Everybody can have an opportunity. And don't, and like I tell my kids all the time, I'm stepping outside of my scholarship for a moment into my mentor mode. The world does not revolve around NASA. You can make 10 worlds of which you don't know about this one. And there's so much out there for you to go out there and explore. And I encourage you to encourage your kids to explore and do as much as they can. And they can start that with joining Junior Achievement next year. Yeah, yeah actually, I, I was going to say, no, but honestly, thank you guys very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Eric, for reaching out to us. And um, it would have definitely been a loss if we had come out here and met all of you guys. You're very bright. You're very engaging, very kind. Your food is extremely good, and that comes from a lot of email, where a lot of emails cook really well too. So, thank you all for everything. Thank you for this opportunity. And if there's anything that we can do, don't be shy. This is not for shyness. Let us know. We'll come and help.